Okay, and welcome to this segment of Grow Big Red, which is a production and a cooperation with uh, here at KPAO and also Nebraska Extension, which is a division of the University of Nebraska. My name is John Fesch, and I'm joined by my colleague John Porter. And we're going to talk about spring lawn care, a variety of other things. And we're also going to talk a, a little bit about the uh, collaboration or the kind of the interaction with the recent weather events that we've had here in eastern Nebraska, namely the flood and some heavy duty ice and snow buildup. And the two do affect each other without, without a doubt. A lot of people do care a lot about lawns. In the flood areas especially, let's talk about that as we begin here, John. Okay. In those areas that were flooded out, um, we've got a couple of issues to, to start with. First of all, a lot of those areas around Ashland and maybe up to Fremont and uh, Columbus and those areas, we had a lot of deposition, uh, salt and, and um, not salt, silt, <laughs> it sounds like salt, right. uh, silt and sand and just a lot of areas that had a lot of material that was in a ditch somewhere uh, that, or in a river bottom that now is on people's lawns. And that becomes a real problem to deal with. Right, so you know we, we have all of that that's, that's come downstream. There's lots of different stuff that's mixed in there. We don't yeah. really know what it is. Yeah. So then the question is, what can, we, what can we do with that? And what, or what do we have to do? Can we just leave it in place? Do we have to remove it? What, what is your answer? <laughs> well, my answer is to try to get rid of as much of it as possible. And, and that usually involves a skid loader or some sort of uh, a bobcat or something like that. Um, and then uh, also trying to work some organic matter back into the soil so that it is again capable of growing some decent turf grass. If you leave it in place, what will happen is you end up with layers. Um, layers of, of this kind of soil with these physical properties which are typically pretty well drained and nutrient poor. And then below it you're going to end up what was in the lawn which is, tends to be kind of a clay silt base which is nutrient rich but poorly drained. And typically what will happen is in that upper layer, the water will run right through it and then hit the bottom and then stop. And um, kind of almost create a very, very large container garden that should be a lawn. Right. So, so that what, doesn't work very well. So, yeah, so talking about not working very well. So what, what happens whenever we don't, we don't have that drainage? We have a saturated soil condition um, and all those air spaces fill up with oxygen and the roots just die. Right. So not, not going to be too good. So we try to get rid of as much of that as possible. And that's a lot of work. So my advice and our advice would be to not, you know, just be reasonable about it. Try to do it as well as you can and not do it all at once. You may need to kind of do that in stages. And it, it might be a situation where you have to do um, some removal and off-site moving of that material. And then obviously doing some reestablishment. Um, and again, maybe a blessing in disguise in a number of these situations. If you don't have too much of that material, um, you may have an opportunity now to work some compost or something like that into the garden, uh, into the lawn, into the ornamental plantings, uh, because now you're kind of ripping things up again. It's almost like after a fire, you get a chance to repaint and rebuild the uh, garage floor or the garage walls. Uh, you have that opportunity while it's all ripped up to do something about it. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, once you have that material removed, then it's a good idea to do some extensive power raking. Now, if you're not familiar with uh, power raking, uh, it's also called vertical mowing. And I think the vertical mowing is a good indicator of the process itself. So instead of a lawn mower, which most people know spins like this in a horizontal, or a, yeah, horizontal fashion, kind of circular, to cut the grass, um, this is similar except vertical. <laughs> so instead of one blade that spins this way, you have about 15 blades that spin this way. Uh, typically people like to power rate because it's just, you know, invigorating and, and it really encourages a lot of turnover. But, you know, if you don't have to do it, we don't recommend it because right. it's really destructive to the lawn. Yeah, so it's sort of like, you know, it's, it's just satisfying because you can <laughs> see that you've done a lot of work. Exactly. Like it, it, you know, it's one of those practices. People do these things all the time. It's like there's really no benefit or even like a detriment to it. But we actually see that, right. oh, well, we're actually seeing our results, so it must be doing something. Yeah, I think people like to see a, a sort of a reaction to it, you know, or, or something different, some kind of visceral response almost. But in this case, it's necessary because we have to, uh, we have to get a seed bed created for that new seed to fall into. If you didn't do that, you would put the seed out on top of this uh, remnants of the silt and the sand, 
and the grass, would, the grass blades would just sit there and kind of be bird food. They wouldn't really come into contact with the soil that you need them to come into contact with, and you wouldn't have any desirable results. So power raking is going to be essential. Sometimes people ask, well, what about aerating? Is that good enough? And no, you're probably only going to create about 10% of what you need with aerating. Aerating is good for compaction relief, but it doesn't really go far enough in terms of seeding, especially after a flood and all the deposition of the silt and the sand. Right, so in, and that uh, aerating, is that where I put all my football cleats and go out and, and walk around in the soil, or is, or is that actually creating more problems than that, it's fixing? That actually creates more problems. That actually compacts the soil a little bit, and we have all kinds of soil problems to begin with. We don't need to be adding to it. So not football cleats, but uh, the aerating is actually pulling little plugs out of the ground. And that works really well for a regular established lawn. So if you haven't had the flood, uh, this is a great time to do that and then try to do some uh, cultivating afterwards. So it's a good compaction relief technique. But if you're trying to do some reseeding, the power raking is really what we do. So the power raking is important. Following that, we want to think about the area itself. And we have uh, generally try to divide these into sunny areas and shady areas. So we want to look for the label itself. Now this one is kind of a sunny area mix. And this one is a little bit more of a shady mix. And by Nebraska state law, they have to list out exactly what the uh, components are. This is a nice mix of shady adapted cultivars of bluegrass and also a lot of tall fescue. Mm -hmm. And this is mostly uh, perennial ryegrass and uh, Kentucky bluegrass. Yep. So a good garden center will be able to help you select the right one based on your condition. So you want to really be honest about the area. Is it a sunny area? Is it a shady area? Yeah, don't be aspirational. Like it gets two hours of sunlight <laughs> and you know, oh, it's sunny, right? It's, it's not sunny. I like that adjective, aspirational. Yeah, don't I, be aspirational. No, you, don't, you want to be honest and straightforward with it. it right, it's all about right plant, right place, regardless of whether it's a vegetable, whether it's a flower, whether it's a shrub, or whether it's lawn seed. So that's the next thing to think about and put on the proper rate. With bluegrass, you tend to be about three pounds per thousand square feet and with the fescue is about nine pounds per thousand square feet. And then at seeding time there's a brand new product, well actually it was brand new in 2018, but a brand new product that a, a couple of different companies had um, that uh, replaces a very old poor product. The old product that didn't work very well but was recommended if you had a heavy weed pressure situation was Siduron or Tupper Sand. And it controlled the, the crabgrass that would usually follow a seeding operation about 50% or mm -hmm. so. And it was very expensive. An application would probably cost you 70 bucks or more. Um, the newer products, the ones that contain the, the uh, tenacity, or a long word, mesotrione. And tenacity is much easier to remember. <laughs> tenacity is much easier to remember. So again, it comes in a product bag right. like this, and that label will have the actual information on it. And it's starter fertilizer along with crabgrass control. And the desirable thing about this, the target action, is it's going to suppress the crabgrass seed, which is in the soil, but not suppress the new desirable lawn grass seed. So it's very good. You know, the, the crabgrass seed is a little bit like the tomato sauce, Prego. Mm -hmm. It's in there. Right. It's, the average square foot of soil is going to have, I don't know, five, ten thousand weed seeds in it. So you're going to have a lot of weed seeds. So the, the automatic assumption is that, yes, you've got crabgrass, you've got foxtail, um, you've got weeds that you want to suppress. They're going to be in there. You do a lot of uh, vegetable gardening right. and also trialing with some of these new All-America selections. Um, you have to fight these weeds all the time. Oh, yeah. So we have bare soil. So yes. we have to fight them all the time. And yeah. we can't use stuff like this. So yeah, it's all, it's all hand or, or mulching. So it's nice to, you know, for lawns that we have this so we don't have to go picking all the weeds out all the time. Uh, so when would we apply something like this for, you know, we can do it while we're seeding, but also, you know, if we just had crabgrass uh, and we needed to apply that, when would we do that? The timing question is very good, John, because we don't want to encourage the grass that is going to regrow. So in a situation that is typical, not all the grass is bad, and some of it will regrow on its own. Um, and if you put out fertilizer, it's just going to go in immediate effect and kick that into high gear. At, at the expense of the new seedlings. Right. So the best timing on that is once you see the new seedlings starting to come up, because otherwise you're just going to encourage the old grass, which will grow well at first and then kind of peter out in the middle of the summer. Mm -hmm. We want to replace it with the new grass and encourage that as much as possible. So you kind of wait for signs. And again, a calendar is hard to use here because, or even a date, the number of days after seeding is hard to use here. 
we can say that typically bluegrass is going to take about three weeks to grow and that tall fescue is going to take about two weeks to grow. But that's just an approximation. It's right. going to depend a lot on the, the sunlight, the temperature, the moisture, and all that. So typically you're going to want to use that as a guideline, but wait for those new seedlings to grow. And when you see about two inches of a thin new seedling, that's the time to put this product on. Perfect. All right. Now also, uh, again, considering the fact that uh, we're, we're wanting these new grasses to grow, uh, a simple device like this works out real well. Um, you want to make some adjustments, or if you're blessed enough to have an automatic in-ground system, mm -hmm. that works well because you're probably working one area, it's not the whole lawn, you're just working one zone, and you can set that by your timer to irrigate just that one area a little bit more frequently and with less volume than the typical lawn situation. So we need to do it so it doesn't dry out because we have these seeds on the surface level right. that we, we want to keep that surface um, moist enough to keep those seeds from drying out. You know, right. Typically with the established lawn or a garden, it's okay to do most of our watering in big volumes because it goes deep, the roots are down. Right. So we, we do want to, to make sure that we're getting that even coverage multiple times a week. But how much are we talking about volume wise? How much water do we, do we need? Oh, so probably looking at about an eighth of an inch of water, but several times a day. Okay. As opposed to maybe an inch or so of water once a week with an mm -hmm. established vegetable garden or an established lawn. So we're just trying to keep that upper eighth of an inch moist. And that's going to require several times again. Again, you're blessed if you have an automatic system to just push the button and let that come on again, as opposed to have to wrangle with something like this. But you can do it with this, it's just more difficult. And the one thing we always see that frustrates us every year is to be driving down the street in the middle of a rainstorm <laughs> and to see all the sprinklers going. So you don't have to water if it's raining. It's, uh, our, it's, it's automatic. Mother Nature is already right. providing that for you. And then that's why it's really something you, you don't want to be traveling on vacation or something like that when you're trying to reestablish a lawn. It's something you have to kind of pay attention to. It's like having a new puppy, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. <laughs> the new puppy has to be trained, and, and so you want to make it make a ruling along that. The final point I want to make today is regular lawn fertilization. And uh, it, that just comes in a product like this where you just lawn fertilizer. And again, our newest research and our newest um, recommendations would call for this around Arbor Day. But the new research is indicating maybe you don't need as much as is called for on the label itself. We like to be watering and, um, and growing established grass, grass that is growing well. If you look out at the lawn and it's this green like you see here, why would you need to add nutrients to that? Right. It's not all that necessary. So what we recommend is if you've got an, a medium to dark green grass, uh, maybe cut this down. Maybe put on, oh, a third of what the rate calls for on the label itself. Do a little quick math and figure out how to do that. So the, the basic calendar days still hold pretty regular, but what we're recommending is lower amounts of that, and usually you get by just fine with that. So Arbor Day, Memorial Day, Labor Day, and Halloween are those times, but at the beginning, of the season on that Arbor Day application and then that Halloween application, really ratchet that down and only use about a third of what's called for on the label. So we, right. have, we have all of this wonderful information where we can reestablish grass after we've maybe had the flooding and removing the silt and all those steps. And then some others that we can use even if we don't have flooding. So if you have any more questions or need more information, you can always contact us at the Nebraska Extension Office. So we're located centrally in Omaha at 8015 West Center Road. Uh, you can call us at 402-444-7804. Uh, is our phone number. And if you have any questions related to the flood, we have a lot of resources that are available online That's at right. flood.unl.edu. Uh, but thanks for joining us today. We're uh, Grow Big Red with Nebraska Extension. I'm John Porter with Urban Agriculture and John Fesch with Horticulture. And uh, thank you for joining us today. We'll uh, see you again in the near future. All right. Thanks for watching.